to Element Church and week three of Supernatural. I want to welcome everybody at our St. Charles campus, everybody watching online all over the world right now. We have the Philippines online. We have Canada, Thailand. Uh, we have the United Kingdom watching. Just welcome to all of our friends and all the way from California to Florida right now and Texas and all over the United States. Just welcome our friends and family to Element this weekend. So glad you're with us. This week, I'm so excited. We are looking at the supernatural subject of angels, and the Bible has a lot to say about this. Now, speaking of angels, there was a university faculty team that was meeting together, and they had done a lot of good things in the community to help some underprivileged students. And so an angel just appeared in the middle of this faculty meeting and looked at the dean and said, sir, you've done a lot of great things to help people, and we're going to reward you with one wish. You can have one of these three things it's left up to you. You can have the gift of unlimited wisdom, great wealth, or great beauty. Choose. The man thought for a minute and he said, you know, since I'm an educator, unlimited wisdom would be very helpful. And so the angel said, it is done. And the angel just disappeared. So the faculty was just sitting there in awe, stunned at what they just saw happen. And they looked at the dean and they said, now that you have unlimited wisdom, what wisdom would you share with us? And the dean thought and he said, I should have taken the money. <laughs> That's funny. Some of you will get that on the way home. <laughs> there is a lot of misconceptions when it comes to this subject of angels, of supernatural. And we're going to get some clarity today from the Bible. We don't build theology on what we see from Hollywood. That is a horrible place to build your worldview and your biblical view. There's a lot of misunderstandings. Sometimes you might see inside of like cartoons, you'll see angels reflected as a little chubby baby with wings and playing a harp. And that is not accurate biblically. In fact, anytime you see inside of scripture, an angel appearing to someone, pretty much it took the breath out of them and they were fell flat on their face. Angels are described to be often very large, that they're very powerful. They're not cute, chubby, state puff, marshmallow babies wearing bed sheets, okay? Um, also, we'll see things that are uh, misleading inside of movies like It's a Wonderful Life. We're approaching the Christmas season and, and I, everybody you know, tends to want to watch It's a Wonderful Life, great movie, some great stories in there. But the misunderstanding is Clarence, the angel, has to earn his wings by doing a good deed. We don't see anywhere inside of the Bible that angels are earning their wings. We do see that angels have wings, but they they don't have to earn them. They were created with them by all implication aside of scripture. Then there's a great movie out there. It's just a good, fun family movie, and it's called Angels in the Outfield. Anybody see that? Angels in the Outfield. I'm just going to show you a little video clip uh, from Angels in the Outfield, and then we'll make a comment on this. Take a look. Here's the pitch. And Lozado smashes one to deep center. I don't think Williams will get to this one. Angels help your favorite baseball team. I know they didn't help ours this last year, the Cardinals. <laughs> so where were they? All right. Uh, do, do, does God really care that much as to who wins that he's going to send angels from heaven to help lift up players to catch a fly ball? Probably not. 
What we are going to see is how angels do show up inside of human history and inside of our lives and even inside of this room right now. Just because you can't see a uh, spiritual realm does not mean it exists. It is there. It's just beyond our human senses because it is a different dimension, but that doesn't mean it isn't real. You know, what's interesting is dogs can hear about 10,000 times better than we can or close to something like that. They can smell things that we can't smell. Any deer hunters this time of year, if you're uh, getting ready for deer hunting or maybe you're in archery, you know that if you're hunting, you always want to be downwind from the deer because their ability to smell is about 10,000 times greater than us. So there are things that they can sense that we can't. And in the spiritual realm, there's things you and I can't see, but it doesn't mean it's not real and it doesn't exist. And we're going to see some, I think, uh, fascinating things. Now, the Bible talks about angels 273 times. If the Bible talks about this subject that much, and it talks about and references angels more than demons, then we should be talking about what God talks about. We should be talking about this important thing. So let me give you the definition of angels. Definition is this. Angel is derived from the Greek word anglos, which is a translation of a Hebrew word that simply means messenger. An angel is a messenger. So if an angel predominantly is a messenger by nature and function, then let's go ahead and take a look at what the message that angels tend to give. Now, at Element Church, uh, one of the primary things that we focus on when we're teaching and we're putting our weekend experiences together is not information, but transformation. Our number one priority is not to preach to your head, but to preach to your heart. And so this is a very difficult subject because there's 273 passages regarding angels. We could go a lot of different places. We could talk about the angel angelic hierarchy. We could talk about powers, principalities. We could talk about the four types of angels that are listed inside of scripture, the archangels and the cherubims. And we could talk about that, but we're not going to. Is grandma, is she an angel watching over you that when she goes to heaven? No, because she doesn't change from a human being to an angel. When we die, we get to heaven. We don't become angels. The major distinction between us and angels is this. Jesus died for our sins not for angels. Jesus died for us. We're his creation. Uh, we will, with angel, like angels, we'll worship God forever. We're going to serve God forever. But we are higher than the angels inside of eternity because we're adopted as God's children. We're born again into the kingdom of God. Angels are sent to serve us and help us in God's mission for our life. That's pretty cool. Plus, let's be honest, I really don't want grandma to be an angel watching over me 24 hours a day because there's just some things you don't want grandma to see. <laughs> don't judge me. <laughs> so inside of this, I'm a, I spend a lot of time praying and I, I do every, every message getting ready, but I actually spend a little extra time praying on this because I'm like, God, you know, how do I not just talk about information about angels? What's the application for our life? God, what is it that you want to say to our life that isn't just informational to our head and academic, but is transformational in terms of our heart? And I really believed I was, there's times when God lets me struggle as a pastor. I'm just going to take you into my private world just for a moment. There's times as I'm preparing a message, God will let me flounder and trying to figure it out. And I'm just like, God, what are you trying to say? What do you want to say to your people? And I'm like, Lord. And then the next day, I'm like, Lord, I still I need a word. I need a word. I need a word. And he'll let me reach the point where I'm like, God, help. And then he'll go, okay, here it is. Because God just reminded me, you're not that good, and you couldn't figure it out without me. If you're praying right now for something, and it's not working, and you can't figure it out, it's just God loving you enough because he's just enjoying the extra time with you. If God answered every prayer every time, the moment that you prayed, he would never see you until you had another need. He just enjoys being with us, and he likes to remind us we need him. So I was in, in, in prayer, and it was, a little, it was getting a little longer in my message development than normal. I had tons and tons of research, and I'm like, God, what is it that you want us to see? And it was just click. The Holy Spirit took me to this passage, and I want to read it to you, and the three points for our life today are in one passage, Matthew chapter uh, 28 and verse 5, and there are two ladies that are visiting the tomb of Jesus on Resurrection Sunday. It's Mary of Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James the Less. And they arrive there, and Jesus 
Jesus is already resurrected, and they see an angel. Verse 5, but the angel answered and said to the women, do not be afraid. In King James, you'll see it stated this way, fear not, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen. As he said, come and see the place where the Lord lay and go quickly and tell his disciples he is risen. The three messages that you almost always see inside of an angelic visitation is this, fear not, come see, go tell. Oh yeah, mic drop, there it is. I'm gonna say it again and we're gonna unpack it. Fear not, come see and go tell. That is the predominant message that angels are to give. There's classes of angels. We see that Michael is a warring angel, but inside of all his warring, it's still about we don't have to fear. It's about propelling us to come and see Jesus that we might go and tell the good news of Jesus Christ. So, when we see uh, the angel appear to Mary, Gabriel, he's a messenger angel. Every time you see Gabriel, he was always bringing a message. Every time you see Michael, he's a warring angel, but it all still centered around these three things. Fear not, come see, go tell. And so the first thing the angel says is to Mary, fear not. There were shepherds watching their flock by night. They said, fear not. Whenever you see angels appear, the first thing they tend to say is fear not. Why? Because if you see an angel, it's a freak out moment. I question people who see angels all the time. When you read the book of Acts, it's easy just to think it was a few weeks or a year period of time. But when you read the early church, the book of Acts spans 32 years of early church history. And there were four major encounters of angelic visitations. And all four of them were centered around people that were perpetuating the gospel, not trying to find a remote control that was stuck in the couch. So anytime you see somebody who's always going, I saw an angel, I saw an angel, I saw an angel. Oh, you saw something. Right. An angel poured my fruity pebbles. No, there's a lot more fruity there than your pebbles. <laughs> <laughs> Psalm 91, the message we see first is fear not. Why don't we have to be afraid? Psalm 91, this is one of my favorite passages of scripture. And I'm going to read a little bit of this. A thousand shall fall at thy side, 10,000 at thy right hand, but it shall not come near thee because thou hast made the Lord my refuge, even the most high, thy habitation every Easter and every Christmas. And occasionally, if you can make time for him and fit him inside of your busy schedule of low priorities that have no eternal value. Oh, I'm sorry. Wrong Bible, that was the Burger King translation. <laughs> totally apologize to have it your way. Okay, <laughs> thy habitation, which means perpetual dwelling place. No evil shall befall thee, neither shall any plague come near thy dwelling, for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all thy ways. They shall bear you up in their hands, lest thy dash thy foot against a stone. I love this passage of scripture, but it is a conditional passage of scripture. You can't just claim every promise in the Bible if you aren't submitting to what that passage said. This whole passage begins with those that make the Most High their shelter and their habitation, who dwell under his shadow. This promise is for those who are seeking Christ, living for God. Nobody's perfect and we mess up and we make mistakes, but your pursuit is God, your priority is God. And when you're seeking to dwell under his covering and under his word, you have a promise that he has given angels to watch over you and to protect you and to deliver you from harm. It's a promise. Now, whether or not we have a guardian angel, the Bible doesn't directly say, but there is implication that we do. Jesus said of little children, he said, behold, their angel sees the face of the Lord every day. And it has an implication that there is an assignment that an angel has. I would also tend to agree with that. And we're not being dogmatic because where the Bible's not clear, we shouldn't be dogmatic, but we can read between the lines to come to some probability conclusions. The Bible talks about familiar spirits, meaning there are demonic devils, the entities. We, if you missed the first week of this, we talked about what the Bible says about demons. And uh, this time of month, it's probably good to go back and hear that message because everybody's watching 
Halloween movies, so you might want to see what the Bible has to say about some of that. But there are familiar spirits. Familiar spirits meaning that they are assigned to a particular family. Have you noticed that there's what would call be generational curses or generational struggles? The Bible calls it generational sins, that one sin is handed down from the family to family. You might see an addiction run through a particular family, or an adultery run through a particular family, or poverty run through a particular family. The same issues run through, and the Bible talks about familiar spirits, that they know you better than you know yourself. They've studied you. So if Satan would do that, I would believe God has angels that are assigned to us to protect us in all of our ways. Uh, My uh, high school math teacher was the worst math teacher I have ever experienced ever heard of, but he was a great Christian man. I loved him dearly, so I overlooked his horrible math skills. He couldn't teach addition to save his life, and he was trying to teach me algebra. Fortunately, he tried to teach me algebra three years in a row, same class. That's how amazing it was. So anyway, (laughs) the only class I kept failing was his, and it was algebra. And um, I'm good at life math, just not algebra math. Okay, so uh, anyway, so uh, I would go have Bible study with him every day at lunchtime. And he served as a captain in the United States Army during the Korean War. And this was his favorite psalm. And if you're in a battle and you're in warfare, this is a psalm you want to know. And he had his little Gideon pocket Bible, his little Orange New Testament, and had the Psalms and Proverbs. And he would read this over himself every day. If you're, if you're struggling in your prayer life, like, I don't know what to pray, pray the Bible. You can't go wrong praying the promises of God. And so get Psalm 91, just pray this over yourself. And so he did it. Every day, he would read it out loud and he'd say, Lord, I declare over me, a thousand can fall at my left, 10,000 at my right. It will not come near me. No plague shall befall me. You give your angels charge over me. And he would say that every single day. And he told me several stories, but the one that stood out to me the most of Psalm 91 playing out in his life is he said one day he was standing kind of on a hilltop and he was surrounded by uh, some lieutenants and he had sergeants and he had a team there. They were looking at some maps, figuring out some strategies and a random artillery shell came in, landed in the middle of them and just made a massive explosion. And when the dust had settled, he alone was standing there. Everybody literally next to him was gone. All there was was boots. That is a mathematical impossibility, that he could be there unscathed, unharmed. And he said, Eric, I just know that I know, according to Psalm 91, angels were watching over me, and a 1,000 fell at my left and 10,000 at my right. And he goes, angels of God protected over me. Now, the promises of God are this. It's for those that are serving and seeking Christ. But God, in his mercy, will intervene even in lost people's lives, people who don't know Christ, as just an act of mercy. My uh, grandfather, his name was Jack, and when he was in his late 20s, he told my mother this story. He was driving in a tunnel, and a car had swerved into his lane, and it was one of those moments where you go, you can't do anything. There's, you can't swerve. You can't move. He knew he was going to go into a head-on collision. At the speed he was going, the speed the car was going, he knew he was going to be dead instantly. The only thing he could do was just close his eyes and brace for the inevitable. So he closed his eyes. Now, he's an atheist, by the way when this happened. Closed his eyes, waited for the inevitable, but the inevitable didn't happen. And he opened up his eyes, the car had passed, and seated next to him was a man who said, Jack, it's not your time, and disappeared. Now, my grandfather's an atheist who was an incredibly brilliant man. In fact, he was the head of the entire ATF for the West Coast. He did wiretaps for Robert Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy. He, 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 he did all kinds of cool governmental covert stuff. They made two TV shows, uh, Dragnet, from Jack Courtney's cases that he had solved on drug busts and all kinds of things. He got to sit on the set at Dragnet, had a chair, and give continuity direction. So, like, he was a brilliant man. And he had this encounter where God had mercy and saved his life. Now, had God not saved my grandfather My mother wasn't born yet, and I wouldn't be here today had God not supernaturally intervened in my grandfather's life to preserve it because I wouldn't be here telling you the gospel today if God hadn't intervened. Now, for almost 50 years, my grandfather kept 
resisting God. And my mother told me this story because he told her the story. And so when I was a teenager and I'd be witnessing to my grandfather and he would try to get all evolutionary and academic on me. And if he ever stumped me, I would just go, hey, grandpa, tell me that story again about the angel that appeared to you when you should have died, but you didn't die, but God spared you. Tell me about that. And he'd just get mad. (laughs) And eventually he did get saved and he gave his life to Christ. But here's what's sad. He wasted all of his talent and all of his potential that he could have been using for God because he waited till the end of his life. But thank God he did get saved. There was a missionary who lived in the 1800s. His name was John G. Patton. And he was a Scottish missionary to the cannibal islands of the South Pacific Islands. And he was winning many of the the cannibals to Christ. And one of the chiefs got angry that his village was being converted to Jesus. So he hired a hitman to kill the missionary and his wife when they slept. So this hitman went to this, this, this house of this missionary to kill him while they slept. And he came back freaking out to the tribal chief. He goes, I'm not going back there. There was a row of people outside of his house, all dressed in white, and they looked really powerful. So the tribal chief said, well, you just drank too much alcohol, too much whiskey, and so take more people with you next time. So he did. He went back the next day with a larger group of men, and this time they saw three rows of people dressed in white, powerful outside. They came back, they told the chief, and the chief dropped it. So later the chief had a conversation with this missionary. He said, where do you keep those men that guard your house in the, in the nighttime? And he goes, what men? They were angels. What's interesting is when you look at church history, what you will tend to find is story after story after story like that of those that are advancing and propagating the gospel where God is intervening in supernatural, angelic things such as that. Again, I don't think God is stressed out about where your remote control is. But if you want to be about Jesus and about his kingdom and about his work, I have a feeling you'll begin to experience a supernatural life at a far greater level when you're no longer living for just natural things. If angels are given to protect us, then people go, well, then why did bad things happen to to good people? Why do bad things even happen to Christians? Uh, I, I, I read a joke where somebody said, well, where was that angel on my wedding day? (laughs) I want to read to you an encounter where Satan quotes to Jesus part of Psalm 91 that we just read. So Jesus at the beginning of his ministry, he's fasted 40 days and Satan tempts or tests him and takes him to the top of the pinnacle of, uh, in Jerusalem of the temple and tells him to throw himself down. Matthew chapter six and verse, I'm sorry, Matthew four, chapter, uh, chapter four, verse six. If you're the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. And Jesus said, it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Know this, Satan knows the Bible better than most Christians know their Bible. Satan literally quoted from the scripture. Now here's what you'll always find. Satan misquotes scripture by leaving out essential parts of scripture because he left off the last part of this verse to keep thee in all thy ways. In other words, when God is addressing Psalm 91, the implication is when you're walking in the ways of God, you have safety and protection. In the perfect will of God, you're invincible until God allows something. That's encouraging. So Satan left off that little point. Satan will always take scripture, twist it, and misuse it. That's why as a believer, you need to know your Bible. That's why we need to be like the Bereans, to search the scriptures daily, to see if these things are true. Don't just take my word for everything as your pastor. As I teach these things, and our teaching team teaches the word of God on the weekends, or as you're in your small group, as you're studying, you go back and search these things to make sure that what we're telling you is in the Bible and biblically accurate and in context. So Satan took it out of context. 
And Jesus said, you should not tempt the Lord your God. The reason many people have died before it was their time was because they moved out of the will of God and tested or tempted God. In other words, they got outside of his covering and protection. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 2, Proverbs 9 and 11 both say this, that wisdom will add to length of days and length of years. If wisdom will add to your life, then stupidity can take away from it. And there is a state next to us <laughs> where the motto is, look, Ma, no hands. That is <laughs> the beginning of a death sentence. <laughs> when we do stupid things, we put ourselves into positions of being taken out early. Now, as a pastor now for 30 years, half of those, I was a youth pastor, and the other half here, the pastor of Element Church, the founding pastor, I have seen, unfortunately, probably, I've seen hundreds or maybe thousands of people uh, go on to be with the Lord. I've seen other people die without the Lord, and that breaks my heart. Now, when a believer goes to heaven, we rejoice because the worst thing isn't when a Christian goes to be with Jesus, it's when a sinner goes to hell. And it bothers me that we pray to keep Christians out of heaven more than we, keep to, than we pray to keep sinners out of hell. Something's upside down with that. But if I'm gonna, I, I was thinking about this, and I was meditating on it, and this was, I feel, an accurate statement. Probably of the third of the people that I have known that have passed away, I would probably say a third of them fall into the category of having died prematurely because they were living a life that was unwise. Many of the people that we have buried, especially when I was a youth pastor and teenagers would die, it was because they were speeding and they were reckless. They were driving without a seatbelt. They were trying to impress somebody and they got into a car accident and they died. I can't drive, 55, Sammy Hagar song. It's fun to rock out to, but it's a really bad motto to live by. One time I was preaching to a group of teenagers and I, I, uh, the whole room, and I just said, I, I just feel right now, I had a word of knowledge. And I said, I feel right now, and I was talking about living a wise life. And I said, right now I feel I have a word of knowledge, and that is there's somebody here that if you don't change the way that you drive, it's going to cost you your life. And there was a kid sitting right next to uh, this, this kid, and he goes, he goes, I felt God in that for you because you're reckless and you're careless. And this kid said to his buddy, he goes, I won't drive with you again until you get your driving under control and you start driving safely. That was on a Wednesday night. Two nights later, he calls, that, calls the friend that said, I'm not driving with you anymore because that was a word from God to you. And he goes, hey, go out with me. And he goes, no, I'm not going out with you until I know that you're gonna listen to the word that God spoke through Pastor Eric to you and you start driving safely. And he goes, ah, whatever. And that kid went out, driving like he normally did, went way too fast around a corner, wasn't wearing a seatbelt. He got thrown from his car, hit his head, and died. And God tried to intervene in that kid's life just two days before that happened. I could tell you story after story of young people that we lost because they were walking outside of wisdom. Now, it doesn't always have to do with driving recklessly because many of us drive our bodies recklessly. You may not be driving a vehicle, but you're driving this vehicle. Look, you can't drive through Mickey D's every day. I don't even know why you pray over that food. Lord, in the name of Jesus, sanctify this for the nourishment of my body. And God's looking at that. I can't do nothing with that. It's just petroleum that's plastic and not even real. I mean, what do I do? I mean, I guess I can give you an extra five minutes to live or something, but I, what do I do with that? And there are a lot of people getting to heaven early because of medical conditions that they brought unto themselves by a poor diet, no exercise, and harmful habits. Jesus will love you all the way into heaven. But there's a lot of people that got there way too soon. Quit blaming Jesus and Ronald McDonald. <laughs> Take ownership. All right, moving on. 
That was all one good point. All right, Matthew 28, verse five. But the angel answered and said to the women, do not be afraid for I know that you come, that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here for he has risen as he said, come see the place where the Lord lay. Come see is the second thing that we always see inside of angelic visitations and it's this. They never draw attention to themselves. They always point attention to Jesus. As a Christian, we are not to be seeking to have spiritual, supernatural encounters with angels. We're to be seeking to continually have a daily encounter with Jesus. We seek Jesus. We don't seek angels. So I had a statement that I said at the beginning of the series when we were talking about demons. There are some Christians that are Satan-focused and Jesus-aware. You got it backwards. We're Jesus focused. We're simply Satan aware. We're aware that he's there, but we're focused on Jesus. When it comes to angels, we're Jesus focused. We're simply angels aware. If you live your entire life and never have an angelic visitation, you're okay because God knew you didn't need it. If you do have an angelic visitation, buckle up. Let me tell you why. Whenever you do see somebody have an angelic visitation, there was some significant persecution, test or trial that they were about to encounter. I stopped praying for them at at about 19 when I saw that in the Bible and I was like, I'm good. If I never see one, it's all good. It's all good. (laughs) Angels always point to Jesus. When you look at the Ark of the Covenant, what's interesting, the wings of the cherubim are pointed inward, and at the center center there is the mercy seat of Christ where the high priest would put the blood of the lamb, which was a picture of Jesus. The angels point to the center. When you get to the tomb, we see inside of one of the gospels that there were angels at the head of the, uh, of the, the slate where Jesus laid, one at each end. Why? Because it's a picture of the covenant where the stained stone of Jesus' blood, because he's fulfilled as the sacrifice for us, and he now sits on a throne of grace that we might receive mercy and grace to help in time of need. Angels are always pointing to Jesus. Matthew, uh, Revelation chapter 19, verse 9. John is caught up into heaven, has a, vi- a vision and a revelation, records the book of Revelation. And so the angel said to me, these are the words of God. Then I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with You and your brothers who hold the testimony of Jesus Christ worship God. Angels always direct attention, focus, and worship to Jesus. We don't pray to angels. We pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. Jesus said, whatever you ask the Father in my name, that he will do it. Our focus is in angels. Our focus is always Jesus. And angels will not receive worship. That's important. Because in the occultic experiences and often in sects that kind of drift away from scripture, they become spiritually focused on angelic things and they shift their focus from Jesus onto angels. This is not a new problem. That's why in 1 John chapter 4, the apostle said, test the spirits to see whether they be of God. Because not every spiritual encounter was from God. The Bible says that Satan can even masquerade as an angel of light. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Galatians 1.8. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we've preached, let him be accursed. There's a book called Mormon. Joseph Smith had an angelic visitation in the 1800s so that the angel could give him the rest of the gospel. When you look on the Book of Mormon, it literally says this, another testament of Jesus Christ. Well, if Joseph had been reading his Bible, he would have known it was a spiritual encounter, but it was a demonic encounter where he was masquerading as an angel of light because that book contradicts the very gospel that Paul preached and that we have in our New Testament. We're to measure everything against God's word because an angel will never contradict God's word. Why are you telling me this? Because there are some people who get tripped up. When I started Element Church 16 years ago now, coming up on January, um, in the first year, there was a, a gentleman who started visiting the church, an elderly gentleman, and he said, Pastor, I, I'm going through some, some marriage challenges, and I, we had 200 people in the church back at that day I, I had time to meet. Uh, and, but 
with 8,000 people that call Element Church home. I'm not able to do the counseling and visitation. And we have phenomenal teams of pastors and lay pastors that are able to do that uh, because I, I just literally just can't. I do have meetings, but I just don't have margin to do this. But I did for him what I would love to do for everybody. And so I met with him and his wife, and I said, what's going on, guys? And he goes, well, my wife wants to leave me. And I go, oh, man, I'm I'm so sorry to hear that. What's going on? And so she says this. She goes, I had an angel visit me and tell me that I need to divorce my husband so I can obey God to be in full-time ministry, and I'm going to such and such state and going into full-time ministry. So I said, ma'am, I said, do you have biblical grounds to divorce your husband? Has he been unfaithful to you? No, he's, he's very faithful. Has he been abusing you in some way? No, no, he's, he's, he's a great man. I said, that was not an angel. It might have been angel baloney, but that was not from God. I said that. I said, ma'am, and I took her to these two scriptures, and I read her these scriptures. I said, what you had was a demonic encounter. I believe you had an encounter, but it was demonic, and here's how we know, because an angel just told, angel just told you to violate God's word, because biblically, you have zero grounds to leave your husband. That was not from God, and she, you know, she you know, went on and on about her visitation. I go, you had a visitation, but it wasn't God because God will never send an angel to violate his own word. He said, I'm the Lord, I change not. I am not a man that I should lie. God will not break his word and he won't send you an angel to do it. What you should have said is get thee behind me, Satan. And I said to her, and I said, ma'am, if you go forward with this, you're gonna put yourself exposure into demonic forces because that was a demonic spirit that came to you and it will be very dangerous if it won't possibly cost you your life. I had a word from God for her. She goes, oh, I'm going to do it anyway. Broke the man's heart, divorced her. He kept coming and God was ministering to him through our church and our people. And I asked him a while later, I said, sir, you know, do you know anything about your wife? And he said, pastor, I haven't been able to locate her. Nobody's been able to locate her and she's now on the missing persons list. Never been found. Why? Because it wasn't the voice of God and it wasn't an angel from God. It was a demonic spirit that she listened to. Follow God's word. Whether me or anybody say anything that violates and contradicts the word of God, we obey God, we obey his word. Matthew chapter 28 and verse 5. But the angel answered and said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen. And he said, Come see the place where the Lord lay and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. The third thing that you're always going to see is angels are saying, Go tell. We don't need to fear, fear not. Come see, come see Jesus and then go tell. Christianity is not just come see Jesus. We love Bible studies, we love to go deeper in the Bible. We believe in small groups. You should be in small groups. You should be studying your Bible. But we don't just come and see Jesus. We're to go and tell people about Jesus. Church is not just to inform your life. It's to transform the world. And the way we transform the world and change the world is through the message of Jesus Christ. Where you see people living supernatural lives are the ones who are about preaching and taking the gospel into their world, into their job, into their business, and unto the ends of the earth. Again, you won't experience a supernatural life simply living for a natural cause. What are you living for? Are you just living to make ends meet? Are you just living for a paycheck? Are you just living to get a bigger house? Are you living to come and see Jesus and to tell your world that he is resurrected and that they don't have to fear because Jesus loves them and Jesus died for them? That's the message that we have. There was a missionary in uh, a dangerous part of the world who was uh, with a group of other missionaries in their group, and they were taking supplies and money into local villages to help with the impoverished area. And they camped outside of a village one night, and they prayed. They said, Lord, we know that there's some local gangs around. It's dangerous. We just ask that you would send your angels to watch over us, protect us, keep us safe. Well, they went uh, that night. No, nothing happened. Everything was good. And they went on and continued their ministry. They made it back home safely. And uh, before they'd gotten back home, when they were in one of the villages, this local gang leader approached this missionary and said, sir, we intended to rob you the other night 
and it happened to be the night that they had just camped outside the village and prayed. We intended to rob you, and we came to rob you while you slept, but there were 27 soldiers around you when we got there. And he said, where do you keep those 27 soldiers? And he goes, I don't know what you're talking about. We didn't have soldiers. He goes, oh, I saw the soldiers. We saw them, and we left you alone. Well, when that missionary got back home to their church, they shared the story about how God had delivered them with what they believed to be an angelic host around them of 27 soldiers. So they compared notes, the church with their missionary, and here's what they found. On the very night that that event happened, there were 27 prayer warriors in their church having a prayer meeting, praying for the safety and protection of those missionaries. When you look at the book of Acts, we see an angel of the Lord appear to Philip, who's called the evangelist. What I love about Philip is he wasn't a licensed and ordained pastor who had gone to seminary. He was an usher. His job was taking care of tables and, and the Hellenistic widows that were overlooked in the distribution. And God elevated him to become an evangelist, to bring revival into a city, and then be sent to a man who was an Ethiopian eunuch to take the gospel to Ethiopia, which even today, several thousand years later, Philip's trace of having gone, this man going back to Ethiopia has shaped that nation for Christ even today. And he was an usher. Don't just think it's the pastor that God uses or the executive pastor's team. God will use you if you'll be about serving. God will use you if you'll be about the gospel. And an angel appeared to him and said, go to the South Road. Why did he have an angelic visitation? Because there was a message about preaching the gospel to somebody that needed it. We see that Cornelius was a Roman centurion and the angel appeared to him and said, hey, call for Peter who's in Joppa right now and he's gonna come and tell you the gospel. There was Peter who was about to be executed, but God still needed him to continue to preach the gospel and an angel was set to him to open up the prison door and help him get free. Paul was on a ship that was about to be wrecked and an angel appeared to him and said, fear not because you still need to go to Rome and preach to Caesar. Here's what you find. The people that encounter the supernatural are the people that are living for the purpose of God, which is to preach, to proclaim the good news to people. Again, you can live a natural life. You, you can get up and you can live the rat race. You can work a job and come home and watch TV and pick navel fluff out of your belly button and you can repeat and have Groundhog Day until you die. And you may get to heaven because you knew Jesus, but that is not what God has called you to be. Amen. And whatever he has for you, it's for you to make a difference. It's for you to be a light. It's for God to use you. God's looking for somebody who'll just say, here I am, use me. Use me in my high school. Use me in my university. Use me at the medical clinic. Wherever you're at, God wants to use you. And you might just be surprised one day that you have stories that nobody else does because you simply said, God, I'll be your huckleberry. I'll close with the story. I was 22 years old and I just started into ministry. And um, I was, most of it was volunteer. Most of what I was doing was volunteering for the youth group. I was in a paid position in an evangelistic ministry and I was a volunteer in my church, in the youth ministry and in the kids ministry. And I was 22 and I was single and sexy. <laughs> and I, I went to a singles event and I'm all about singles going to Christian single events. People who go, man, you, don't, you shouldn't have single events for singles so that they can, I go, shut up. <laughs> and, and don't get me started there. Okay, but anyway, so I, I, um, I was at this event and, and here's what I, 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 was, I, I was there and I felt God say, I want you to leave now. And I just had this impression, it's time to leave. And I go, but God, there's still babes around. <laughs> so I, and I just had this impression. So I got in my car and I started to leave and I felt this impression, I want you to go a different way home. I had a route from that location. I would just, it was actually the direct route. And I thought, okay, that's the direct route, I need to go. But God said, I want you to go this way. So I took a right and I got onto the freeway and I went right. Well, I went one mile down the freeway and, as I was, and it felt like exit here. And as I was exiting here, I was getting off the freeway entrance ramp and right in front of me was a motorcycle. And this motorcycle uh, it was stopped because he had a red light and the light turned green. He pulled into the intersection and underneath the overpass had been a truck that was speeding and didn't see 
the light turn red for him, and he went directly through the intersection and sideswiped this motorcycle going no less than 50 miles an hour. And I just witnessed all this in slow-mo in my life. And this car, this motorcycle gets thrown, and it's like a rag doll literally across this auditorium. This guy's just, this body's just, just like a movie, just rolling over and over and over. And I just go, he's dead. I mean, like, it just, there's no way he could survive that. A car was right behind me or in front of me and it had pulled over with me and it was a lady and she ran out and I ran out and here was this man literally 75 feet, 100 feet, I don't know, from where this event happened, just laying there. And his eyes were wide open, gashes all over, blood was everywhere. His eyes were wide open, he was dead. And this lady was a nurse and she goes, I'm a nurse. And so she, she, she bent down, felt his pulse and he goes, he's gone. And so she started doing CPR with every push. I'm going to be graphic. With every push, blood just came out of every orifice that was lacerated. Just And something happened inside of me. The Bible talks about the gift of faith. And something happened inside of me where I literally heard the voice of God inside this strong. Do not let him die. Call him back. So I bent down. And so she's doing. And I put my hand on the man's side. And it just felt like jello. It was the most weird feeling I've ever encountered. And I put my hand on him and I said, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you, you will live. I call you back. You will not die. Satan, I rebuke you. Death angel, I rebuke you. I command you in the name of Jesus Christ, you will live. And I started declaring that. And as I'm declaring that, this, this big old hand put, was put on my shoulder and I look up over me and this man goes, hey, you're doing a great job, son. Keep up the good work. And he was wearing a bright red Hawaiian shirt, shorts and sandals. And for whatever reason, I look back and I literally, I have it in my head. And he had this gray beard and, I liter- and he's a little large and I literally have it envisioned in my head. And so I, he goes, good job, son. And, and I go, keep up the great work. I go, uh, and I was just in the name of Jesus. And then, and then after that, I felt his hand come off me. And then the man's eyes opened up. They were open, but they were opened. And the man goes, what happened? And the nurse says, you've been dead for five minutes. I look around and the man that had touched me in the bright Hawaiian shirt was gone. Now there was physically nowhere he could have gone in that moment of time. I've never told this part of the story. I've only told the first part because I was waiting for this time when I was teaching on angels to tell the second part. When I got in my car and I drove away, I know two things. That man was dead and God used me to help bring him back to life along with assigning a nurse that could do CPR at the same time. That's God. You have a man full of faith and knows God and a nurse. That's God saving that man. And a large Hawaiian shirt angel saying, good job (laughs) to assure my faith. Now, Before you walk out of here and go, I knew that church was weird. Everybody told me not to go to that church. I knew they were weird over there. I've been serving God for 35 years. I've been a pastor for 30. And that's the one time in my entire life that God has used me to help bring somebody back from the dead. So don't call me. And secondly, it's the only time I've ever seen what I know that I know was an angelic visitation in a Hawaiian shirt to reassure my faith that I wasn't crazy because I needed it in that moment because you feel crazy when you're out there doing that. And I know that I know. Here's the point. If you'll just learn to start listening to God in your daily life and do those little things that Jesus tells you to do, just go tell that person about Christ. Why don't you pray for that person? Why don't you bake some cookies? Why don't you go over there? Why don't you get that kid's application? Why don't you get in the youth ministry? If you'll just get out of your comfort zone and start letting God use you, here's what you find. You might wake up one day and go, I love my life. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Lord, we thank you that you are real, that you left heaven to come to earth to pay for our sins, to rise from the dead so that we can be forgiven. And not only that, that we can partner with preaching the gospel, that we can come and see a resurrected savior and we can go and tell the good news. I pray for anyone that doesn't know Christ, that you would draw them with your love and grace right now. Anyone watching around the world, if you don't know this Jesus, there in our St. Charles campus, if you don't know this Jesus, you can join in with us. He loves you. He's not mad at you. He's just a prayer away. Maybe you've known God, but you've wandered, you've drifted. You can come back with this prayer. Let's say this together, church. Jesus, thank you that you died for my sins, that you rose from the dead. I confess that I need you. I surrender my life to follow you. 
and to call you Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Church, let's give him a big hand clap.